The Upanishads talk a lot about knowledge and the importance of knowledge, which is interesting to me um, because you, I'm sure everyone here has heard me say that awakening is not about concepts, <clears throat> not about knowledge, at least the conventional meaning of knowledge. It's not like you learn enough about awakening or Advaita Vedanta or Buddhism and that equates to enlightenment. It just doesn't work that way. And anyone who's tried know, hopefully knows that. Sooner or later it becomes obvious. But that's not the only meaning of knowledge. It's not the only approach to knowledge. And it could be a start. It can be helpful to learn Buddhist principles, to read the suttas or some suttas, and challenge your own knowledge base with those teachings, those pointings. Or read the Tao Te Ching, and that will challenge your usual way of structuring knowledge, thought, and understanding. Because in conventional ways of speaking, it doesn't really make sense. To the conventional way of thinking, what does in the scene there is only the scene actually mean? It doesn't seem to mean a whole lot. It's kind of like circular logic, right? And yet, it's pointing to a very profound truth, a very profound experiential insight that's available to all of us. The Tao Te Ching, the Tao that can be spoken, is not the eternal Tao. There's something there. The Tao seems to be important, seems to be of interest, and yet, there's apparently a Tao you can speak about, but that's not the real one. That's not the eternal one. So that statement shows this dichotomy in, in what knowledge is or how we utilize knowledge, how we approach knowledge and knowing. So by various means, we will get to the point where we exhaust the usual way of trying to know, trying to understand to set ourselves free. We'll exhaust the usual way of using knowledge, trying to understand concepts about something, including enlightenment and awakening. Uh, we'll exhaust the tendency or the belief that we can use that kind of knowing to end our own suffering, to figure out what the heck they're talking about when they talk about enlightenment, liberation. What does that even mean? Is it just another concept? another dream, another false promise, or is it something completely different, something else? So I might say it's how we use thought, it's how we use the apparatus of knowing that matters. And if we use it in the habituated way, the way we've just found ourselves using it as, an, as we become aware of ourselves as an adult, um, we can very easily, without noticing, stay in one mode of using thought and knowledge. And it's a very narrow mode. It's a, and it's also a very um, well-defined mode well-defined by conditions, by conditioning, actually. But if we get curious enough about where that thought is arising, where it's originating, and we get curious enough about it, not later, but right now, then we have an opportunity to see, um, to know, in a very different way. How does a thought arise? How important is it to even investigate that? How important is it to know that? Is it knowable? 
what is a thought? What is a single thought? To back up a moment, another way into this um, exploration, another way to become interested in thought is to see, as many people do, that thoughts somehow, something about thoughts is why we suffer. Anxiety, depression, self-doubt, hesitation, frustration, expectations that have blown up in our face and cause us to apparently suffer because things didn't go the way we thought they should or the way we thought they would. All of that, if we just take inventory, is structured in thought. It has to do with thought. Thoughts about the future, thoughts about who I am, thoughts about who other people are, thoughts about how I should be treated, how I shouldn't be treated. All of this is thought. So that's another way in. That's another way we become interested and go, wait a minute. What is it about thought that causes us to suffer? Or maybe suffering isn't the right word for you. What is it about thought that causes me to feel anxious? What is it about thought that makes it so I can't stop? I can't actually relax. I have to keep doing and working and moving. I can't actually sit still and be completely comfortable in my own environment. I can't play like I did when I was a kid without concern for anything, without concern for when the play was gonna end, without concern for what's going on in the world, without concern for whether I'm a good kid or a bad kid. We just played. We just engaged life. We engaged the senses. The boat in the bathtub, you know? Blah, 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 blah. Just pure play, pure enjoyment. Pure simplicity. We didn't even know we were playing. It's that simple, right? When did that end? Why can't we do that now? So when we take inventory in this way and we go, man, something seems to be getting in the way. And then we notice what seems to be getting in the way is thought, something about thought, something about me being in an internal dialogue, doubting myself. You know, I can't play in the bathtub because I'm too old for that. I can't play in the bathtub because I have to go take care of X, Y, Z. You know, I can't just roll in the grass because the neighbors will think I'm crazy. All right. By the way, we're going to do grass rolling later. So, um, you know, whatever it is, though, I can't, I can't just fully relax here because even though I'm relaxing, relaxing has become an activity. I'm just, while I'm relaxing, I'm planning my day tomorrow. I'm on my computer, I'm on my phone, right? What, why did this happen? When did this happen? How did this happen? It's a good investigation. And again, if you just kind of look at what's actually extra there, it's the thoughts, you know? Tomorrow, you don't find in the environment. You don't find it when you're looking out at a beautiful meadow, you don't see tomorrow. You just see the meadow. <laughs> you don't see yourself, you just see the meadow. You don't see problems, you see the meadow. You don't see solutions, you see the meadow. Very simple. And, and for a child, it is that simple much of the time. For animals, it's always that simple. Uh, but for us, there's something mitigating our ability to fully just be there. Enjoyment, spontaneity, play. <clears throat> so it's thought or it's something about thought. Something about a reaction to thought, perhaps. So any of these ways that we come upon this investigation are fine, of course. Through curiosity, through suffering, through trauma, through complete disruption in, in our life expectations, through illness. Many people, well, I can think of a good handful that I know personally, um, went into a very deep inquiry and a very deep awakening after a, a life-threatening diagnosis or a diagnosis that is threatening your life. It's basically sending you a message that your life will not be as long as you thought it would be. That can lead you into a um, very sincere, very sincere <laughs> investigation into who and what you are and who and what you're not, most importantly. So all kinds of things can lead us to this curiosity, this query, this investigation. Maybe it's a, you know, you grew up as a Buddhist. You grew up as, you know, who knows? You grew up in contact with some tradition that talks directly about this. That may be it as well. 
Um, but to me, at least from what I've seen, the investigation into the nature of thought and consciousness in one way or another, maybe not spoken in that way, um, may not sound like that at all. In fact, if you pick up the koan, what is mu? It doesn't sound like you're thinking about or investigating thoughts or consciousness or anything like that, but that's exactly what it's doing. It's investigating your true nature in such a direct way that our reaction to thoughts, our need to put thoughts between ourselves and, and experience gets in the way of that investigation at some point. And so it has to stop to really know what Mu is. So it's brilliant. It's a brilliant approach. <clears throat> so there's not even a right approach in, as to how we do this investigation. But we will investigate it at some point. We can investigate it through belief, through just questioning belief after belief. And I think there's a lot of conventional models for that, meaning non-direct kind of awakening approach like I talk about. There's a lot of conventional models for that. But what's interesting is that without the context and the intention of going through the roots of identity and beyond identity, I think a lot of the conventional approaches will kind of hit a wall but because they don't, they, they, they'll start to probably hit a fear barrier. Things like therapy, for instance. You know, there, there's a lot of asking questions and investigating beliefs in therapy, but doing therapy doesn't necessarily wake everybody up, right? Because you'll get to this place where the questions start to get a little scary, right? You'll start to notice maybe that the one you thought you were doesn't seem to be there when you really start questioning in a deep way. I had a friend who was a neuroscientist, neuroscience like undergrad, and she spontaneously led herself into this questioning about who she was, about the way consciousness works. And she went completely beyond the sense of self. And it really, really freaked her out. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't expect that. But she was just asking questions. You know, well, if this is the brain and it's creating this, this experience, well, but, you know, if I'm aware of that, what am I that's, that's you know, here, whether that experience is here or not. Um, and the sense of I is created by, like, all these neurotransmitters. And she just suddenly just went right beyond the sense of I and was very surprised by it. So all kinds of questioning processes can do this. Um, but in this talk, I really want to just address, address it kind of directly. Address the, the problem of thought and consciousness directly or the... It's not a problem, it's very interesting to me. Um, but again, often we find our way into these investigations through recognition that we are suffering and it has something to do with what's going on up here. So what is a thought? Okay, well you can answer the question by adding more thoughts, right? Adding more descriptions. You could say it's a neurochemical process now, that results in the sense of a, a thinker or something, or a sense of a me, right? You could, you could think of it scientifically, sure. You could say it's a handful of neurotransmitters being splooged upon some receptors, or whatever, yeah. Or you could say, a thought is um, a sort of image in the mind. Oh, okay, well, that's, that's a little clearer in experience. That's a little more experientially accurate. Or a thought is uh, some language that's not spoken, it's internally spoken. Yeah, it's reasonably accurate, right? Um, so those are ways of answering what thought is by using more thoughts, by becoming a little conceptual or a little reflective. And the latter answers I gave there are more directly reflective, like you almost reflect in the immediate to know that. Whereas to think in terms of science and all that, where it does have its place, but this isn't its place because that's very conceptual, right? You have to have a whole bunch of other concepts you've learned and then build on those concepts to get to what you're gonna talk about as the, the, true, the uh, accurate truth about what a thought actually is. So the closer, experience closer answers are something like, it's kind of like uh, some internal dialogue. It's kind of like an image in my mind, like I can imagine a frog. Most people can, some people can't. Some people can't have an internal image, but most people can. I can imagine a cat. It's kind of a thought, right? So these are more experience close. 
I would say move in that direction and then go a little farther. Can you actually experience a thought right now without thinking about it? Can you have the experience of a thought right now? Are you already having the experience of thought before it becomes thought? Are you already having the experience of the substance of a thought before it becomes something? Before it becomes structured as an internal experience defining what's going on right now? Is it kind of already there? Something's already there and that something seems to morph into a thought or a perception is it something like that? Can you feel into that? And if that's not true, let's say what I'm saying is not true of your experience, where do you go then when you go inward? Where do you go when you reflect inwardly? Where are you? Where are you right now? Where is the sense of you? Just the pure sense of you without thinking about it. Where is it? Is there not one there? If there's not one there, who or what is aware of that? So this kind of inquiry becomes a little more incisive. Sort of brings you back to an experiential center or a sense of being. Not thinking about a sense of being, being a sense of being, <laughs> knowingly. These are all simple adjustments in your experience right now to just investigate this. Another way of saying it would be, okay, right now I can know, and I'm not talking about truth value, like it's true or false. I mean, know in the sense you could think about it, right? I could know that tomorrow is Friday. Right now I could have that thought that says tomorrow is Friday. I could know that my car is red. I could have that thought right now, my car is red. I could know that a frog is green or something by imagining it, right? There's that kind of knowing. Now, can you know knowing without a thought? Can you know knowing this? Can you know this, the substance of knowing without it becoming something defined? And if you can sense into that, did you do anything for that to happen? Or is it already there? It just is. So knowing this in this way, and if this isn't obvious, go back and do this. You know, like when you when people are watching the video or whatever, go back and, and actually go through what I'm asking you to do. Spend some time with it, you know. But if it's obvious, then you'll know that the knowingness is uncaused. You didn't do it. It's not um, conditional. It's the source of conditions. Very simple. Simpler than simple. It can't get any simpler than this. The moment a doubt arises, the knowingness already knows itself as knowingness, and now it knows itself as knowingness, knowing a doubt. The moment an affirmation arises, like I understand this, the knowingness already knows itself as knowingness, and now it also knows itself simultaneously as affirmation, as another thought. The thought and the knowingness are not two things. The, beautifulness, the beautiful thing about knowingness, or consciousness, is that it never loses its nature even when it seems to take another form, never loses its nature. This is where the, the old analogy of the ocean and the wave is really good because it's quite accurate. A wave can form on top of the ocean. If you identify with a wave, it'll seem like you're this discrete wave. The ocean could even be scary. But when you realize you're the ocean or the, the source of the wave, the substance of the wave is water and the vastness of that water has completely never changed. It can't change. It's just a wave forming or a swirl within it. Better than a wave on top, it's more like an eddy within the water somewhere. That's a thought. That's how a thought feels. But we forget that we are the ocean in one sense. We're, we forget that what we're taking being to be 
is actually the entirety. It is all of being. What we're taking knowledge to be um, without seeing it is just one part of the knowingness. It's not the whole of knowingness, but the whole of knowingness is always there. When this clicks, it's kind of funny because it's almost as if all of everything you thought you knew or, or did know, everything you knew, all your life, your history, your past, all thoughts, all beliefs, all of it is just suddenly illuminated with that knowingness. That's knowledge. In my, my humble interpretation of the Upanishads, that's knowledge. I think that's what they meant by knowledge. It's a very different kind of knowledge. John Tan had a thing he said that he used to lead himself back into that experience of, of unbound I am. And it was um, anything and everything there is that is is me. To me, that says the same thing. It's the knowingness is all encompassing of anything we could perceive, of all types of perception, including the major type of gross perception, which is thought. <clears throat> and it's a, quite a relief often. It's like, wow, I couldn't go anywhere if I tried. Where are you going to go? You can't, you can't be lost. You can't be found. You don't need to be lost. Lost and found doesn't make any sense. Lost and found occur within you, so to speak, in this way of speaking. Within the vastness of being, which is the only way you could ever know yourself. All the ways you know yourself, all the divided ways you know yourself, right? I'm, you know, anything, anything you think you know about yourself limits what you are, right? It means you're a whole lot of other, there's a whole lot of other things you're not. All those limitations, those are also just the knowingness. Those apparent limitations. All the things you think you're not, those are also the knowingness. The knowingness is the whole experience of being. You. That's what people mean by the I am sense, I think. Th that use it in a traditional way. It frees up everything. In, in one way of seeing it. It's already there. You're already in contact. You've never lost contact with anything, any part of yourself, any part of anything, any part of the world. Everything you perceive and as you perceive it is this, this knowingness. And consciousness is one of the five aggregates. Um, and one of the, I always have trouble quoting suttas because there's so many of them and the names are hard to describe and I forget where I read them, but one of the suttas in the Pali Canon um, described it very well that the way, I, the way I experienced it was exactly the way it was written here. And it was, um, I think it essentially said consciousness is a reflective experience, but it's, it's distorting in nature, it has the potential to distort, which is 100% true. Sound, or I'll just say hearing, or the herd, doesn't distort. It's undistorted, it's undistortable. It doesn't, it doesn't have <laughs> substance. It doesn't have quality. It doesn't have the potential to distort. It, does, it doesn't have the potential to cause delusion. So what, what does? Consciousness. So while this initial um, shift in this experience of consciousness is tremendous, it's huge, it's very important, it's a critical step in the awakening process, it's the beginning of the true awakening process. Um, there are a couple things to know about it. So this maybe is a little bit more like esoteric knowledge or later knowledge, but it's helpful to know that it, it can be distorting. The, the reflective mind, even when you see the reflection as one whole reflection, even when you see the ocean and feel the ocean as one whole ocean, the oceanic experience of being, that's great. 
but it's not the end of the story. It has a potential to distort. And again, the water analogy is nice here because water is kind of fluctuates, right? It can, like in my book, I talked about the surface of a pond becoming very ripply and it looks very, like the light that's shining on the top of the pond looks very divided and fractured up, right? But it, still the water is just the water. It's still one vast body of water. Nothing has become divided ever anywhere. Um, and yet something about it, the way we regard it, when we believe in the reflection, when we believe in the reflection, we get fooled. We fool ourselves. And we fool ourselves in a very specific and kind of fascinating, but it's a little bit tragic way. We become convinced we are one of the reflections. That's very strange, but it can happen for some reason. And when we become one of the reflections and all of the other reflections are not us. That feels isolating. Again, distorting, distorting in nature. It's not the fault of consciousness. That's not the fault of the ocean or the pond. It's sort of the fault, if there is a fault, in the way we interact with it, if that makes sense. So again, thoughts are not a problem. It's the way we interact with them. A thought we believe, it can be extremely distorting. A thought that's seen as a thought is not, right? We can have a thought that says, I hate that person. But when we see that's a thought, it's just a thought. When we believe we hate a person or a group of people, we can do horrible things, especially in groups of people who have that belief. So belief in a thought and a thought are very, very different things. So don't beat yourself up when you have thoughts. The fact that you know you are having thoughts is really, really good. It's, it's auspicious. It's grace. And it's a huge step, even if there's been no shift in identity, even if you don't know what the hell we're talking about when we talk about non-duality. The fact that you can actually become aware of one thought after another after another is huge. It makes a big difference in your propensity for harm to yourself and others. I think Eckhart Tolle said in his book somewhere, the moment you become aware of a thought, you're, you're already in presence. I think that's how he said it, something like that. But that initial disidentification from one thought um, may come as a huge relief, and it may just come as like, oh, wow, okay. Wow, I've been believing thoughts in, in a very intense way for a long time, and suddenly I realize they're just thoughts. A thought that says I'm fundamentally messed up, just a thought. A thought that says I need to figure this out, just a thought. A thought that says, you know, Joe Schmo is, is a rotten person, that's just a thought. Really, they're just thoughts. Again, that doesn't automatically lead to the insight, the direct experiential insight of vast unbound consciousness, but it can. And if, you, if you're vigilant enough about it in the moment, like moment to moment, as a process, as an inquiry, it can definitely lead to that. Because pretty quickly you're going to see how much actually is thought. The sense of being the thinker, the sense of having knowledge of a world, all of it. It's not, it's not to say there's no world out there when you're doing this. You just realize the world you think that's out there is a thought. Or may or may not be, but it's not what you, it's not the thought. The thought isn't it, right? <clears throat> it's a thought. It's reflective. It's distorting. Sometimes it's a little bit distorting. Sometimes it's a lot distorting. And what happens ultimately uh, at some point with this, if you get, again, vigilant about it, cross the fear threshold and things like that, or life just turns your etch sketch over and shakes it up for you, like, which can happen, um, then what happens is that series of thought after thought after thought, which if you get the reflective nature I'm talking about, that, that a thought is ultimately a reflection, right? So if I think about what I had for breakfast today, it's a reflection. There's no breakfast here, you know, but I, my mind can reflect on it somehow inwardly. Um, when you get that and you really start to see that the stream of thoughts themselves are actually reflecting the last thought, 
then you have the opportunity to break that chain, which that, that reveals something very different. It reveals the world as it's always been, but in a very different way. Surprise, it's quite surprising. So that's what I mean by being vigilant, thought after thought. If you just kind of here and there notice thoughts aren't what you think they are and you know notice a thought as a thought here and there, that's good. It's good work, it's important, but sometimes you'll just, for me it was out of like a sort of, well it was vast amounts of frustration and pain, but it was also this kind of rebellion. Like something is pulling the wool over my eyes. Something is making things look as they're not. I knew it, I could feel it. It was doing it for my parents. It was doing it for all the adults I'd ever met because they were all nuts. I knew it and I felt it. There was just something not right about the way I was perceiving it. And I guess to finally realize that I was seeing it that way, it didn't matter what anyone else was doing out there. The fact that I was seeing it that way, I could address it. I could find the problem, I guess. And I knew I had to do a thought. So for me, it became like almost like an obsession in that moment of seeing every single thought as nothing but a thought, that it's not inherently true. It's just one thought, thought after thought after thought. And once that happened for me, this may happen differently for anyone in here. It's happened for people in this room already, several of us, but it doesn't matter how it happens, but that's how it happened for me. And it didn't take long actually. It didn't really take that long. Um, because I could feel it. I was like on the trail of something, you know. And uh, bloodhound, a bloodhound. <laughs> <laughs> Something's not right here. I was a Basindi. So, um, yeah. So, so again, just to make a contrast because I think most people watching this and everyone in this room knows the experience of seeing one thought as a thought. I've gone, wait a minute. I've believed that for so long, but it's, it's really just a thought like any other, right? It's very free. It can be very freeing, but I want to make the distinction between that and literally breaking energetically the chain of thought after thought after thought after thought. Um, not through suppressing thoughts, not through disassociating, not through strain, but through vigilance and seeing every single thought arising for what it is. And maybe at the same time, this may or may not play into your experience, but maybe seeing that whatever the hell you are right now that's doing this or aware of this or whatever is definitely not that thought or that thought or that thought. And something really starts to come forward. Something ineffable, um, something wondrous, something kind of like new, but also ancient in your experience. Um, and then for me, it was just like a, literally I just like flipped over. All of a sudden that thing that had come forward, that was just everything already. And the thoughts were like gone. They were like in the periphery for a while. There was like almost no thought. And it was, they were just, go I could see they were ghosts. Could cause no harm, just thoughts. There was no tendency to grab thoughts, pull onto thoughts, struggle with thoughts. They were just gone. And there was just sound, movement, sensations. And when there was a thought, there was just thoughts. There wasn't a strain or struggle with the thoughts. So it was just one seamless experience is one way of saying it. But the seamless experience was very light. It was very, well, more than light. Uh, There's no substance. This hasn't really changed, by the way. I mean, there were definitely like a lot of shadow work and a lot of stuff that had to be worked through and continues to. I mean, it never stops in one sense, but, um, but the fundamental knowing of this ease, this formlessness, I mean, that doesn't change. It doesn't, it doesn't like come back. It's not like you can suddenly believe in the thought world again. You might believe a thought. You might get caught in a thought and get caught in a narrative but you won't feel the, uh, that inner world of that narrow band of experience anymore. So it's broken. It's like a spell, like a spell that was broken. Like you were under a spell. I think it's funny because when you see this, you, you realize a lot of, I don't know, 
myths and even like old wives tales and pop culture like sayings they really do kind of point to this you know being under a spell come back to your senses you know things like that and then all the really heavy mythology like we were talking about the other day like the devil and all these demons and all you know they live within they live within us <laughs> they they uh their their potentialities i guess they're energies of some kind but the conditions for unconsciousness are what bring bring that pain body forth or make it possible to come forth so we make a huge uh, dent in the potential for unconsciousness with this kind of investigation and this kind of shift so if this ever feels complicated or complex or evasive or whatever, you can always ask yourself simple questions. Everyone has the potential for this. You don't need some you know, wizard non-duality teacher to say some magic words to you. You can just ask yourself, what is a thought right now? Go right to it. What is consciousness right now? What am I right now? What am I that's knowing? What am I that's perceiving? What am I that's looking out of those eyes? What am I that's feeling? What has the potential to feel, see, hear? What has the potential to know? I think uh, John Sherman said, he boils this whole thing down to like a really simple question of, um, or a statement of put your attention in what it feels like to be you. An active inward looking. It's a pretty good way of saying it, actually. Put your attention in what it feels like to be you. Like, you know what it feels like to touch the dog. You know what it feels like to touch the chair. You know what it feels like to feel the air. Great. Now put your attention on what it feels like to be you. And I, I like how he says, you can't, you can't screw it up. Even if your thoughts tell you like, oh no, that, I, I don't get this, that's not right. You probably touched in for like a second or a fraction of a second or a thousandth of a second. But you will succeed at it. And he said, then you can try again and again and again. You know, it'll often occur to you to do that again. Put your, put your attention in what it feels like to be you. <laughs> it's kind of genius. And don't fool yourself with thoughts about no self. Don't fool yourself with doctrine. It's very easy to do. Oh, I know there's no self. Oh, you do? Where do you know that from? Right now, I mean. Where, do you, where is that knowledge coming? Where, where's the knower of that right now? It's closer than that knowledge, I promise you that. So go there. And you might find it feels nice to just rest there. It's not a... It may feel like a quiet experience, but it doesn't have to. What it feels like is an uncaused experience. It feels like an effortless experience. It's the only thing that's effortless. Maybe I would say that. It's the only thing that's completely 100% effort, effortless. Because <laughs> it's you. Where are you going to go to not be you? <laughs> it's effortless. Truly. So it's the knowledge of knowledge. It's the knowledge of knowing. It's the knowledge of knowingness. It's pure knowledge. Pure knowledge before it becomes understanding. Pure knowledge before it comes, becomes structured as a thought. It's a beautiful word, knowledge, then. 
there may be some ancient Vedic scholar rolling over in his grave hearing me say this, but I'm pretty sure that's what they mean. Because they don't mean, they can't mean like, you know, some <coughs> Vedic words or, or some scriptures, you know. And, it, and also when you read, it's interesting, at least when, when I read about it, and I haven't read a ton of stuff out of the Upanishads, but when I've read, um, it's, it's very vaguely defined, which is cool. Like it's, they don't, it's not really structured in the way it's defined, the knowledge. It's just this word that kind of stands out. And like, you, at least, again, this is totally my perception. It's like, I know they mean something by that, and I know they don't mean what most people would think they mean, or they, they don't mean the usual meaning of it. It's kind of cool how it stands out. Um, yeah, knowingness is a really good word for it. Uh, another way in is to ask yourself, how can I know something? How can I know anything? How can I know something? What's required for me to know something? The knowing of it, the knowingness. So it's sort of like a mirror. If you look into a mirror, um, the reflectiveness of it is required. You could say, well, in that mirror, there's all kinds of stuff. There's a room. You know, you know it's like a reflection, but you're like, there's a room, there's people back there, there's the stuff on the wall. It looks like all this complex stuff that's in the reflection, but the reflectingness, it's so, it's so obvious it's stupid. But it's also so obvious it's stupid when it comes to consciousness. The reflectingness is what's critical. Anything in that reflection could be different and there'd still be a reflection. But if the reflectingness isn't there, it's over. There's nothing. So what is right now here, that knowingness? That's, a, that's a, another potential way to like back yourself into it. Jazz region for something over there. How are we doing? Oh, okay. And there's also this component that no word, description, or label is it. And that's really important because it's also why mu, like a koan, works so well, but specifically mu. What is mu? The way it's used, because you, you can imagine anything about what mu is and go in and tell a Zen teacher and they'll send you right back out to the cushion because you're giving them a label, a description. Um, but when we ask the mind in the usual way, what is Mu? What is anything? We usually, usually expect a thought answer, something we can state, something we can use the symbol of to hand to somebody else, right? The symbol represents something supposed to represent something. What is it that doesn't represent anything because it is already everything? So you can solve Mu, but not in the way the mind thinks it's going to solve it at all. It's solvable for sure. And also that koan to me is quintessential way of to have a one-pointed approach one-pointed because it, it it becomes so concentrated all of the will can be there the will the struggle the frustration all that will can be in there it can be directed with the koan and and yet nothing is given to the mind the thoughts at least no thought will suffice 
So all that will that's usually directed into thought suddenly is not directed into thought anymore, but it's directed somewhere. It's directed into your true nature. And it turns out that's a really good approach. It may just be that the mind goes quiet long enough for a reset to happen, but it works somehow for, for many people. It doesn't, none of these are exact approaches that should work for everyone. Everyone's a little different. Um, many people use inquiry into beliefs. Um, for some, that just happens. It's a sort of random event. Find your way, you know, that find your way into this. Find it whether it's curiosity, stubbornness. I think I, mine was more like stubbornness, frustration. But again, this is uh, it's almost like a mystical thing about this because your way in is only the right is the only way in. It's the right way in because it's you. It's your true nature. <laughs> So, um, so, so a, a, another component of this is just suddenly tripping over something like your mind or your will and landing right into a really profound and surprising authenticity. It's, it's like, it was the first time I felt authentic in my life. I'll say that for sure. It was the first time I felt authentic, felt real. Everything before that felt like a dream. Not a comfortable dream either, by the way. Not a happy daydream. It was a shitty nightmare dream for me. <laughs> it, was so, it was so small and contracted, I did not realize there was an outside of that. So it was a surprise. We hope we can title this video, Waking Up From The Shitty Dream. <laughs> Waking up just from the shitty nightmare of being a human being. <laughs> no, we won't do that. Okay. I think that's everything I got to say. <laughs>